Okay, look at here, ladies and gentlemen. Almost like I opened up my Superman shirt, but then on the other side it said Queen. Man, I was like <laughs> revealing to to my man there, Mister Ryan Hollins. It's good to see you, man. How you doing out hey, there, good in Miami? To see you too, brother. Doing good, man. Doing how's, good. How's Miami treating you? Hey, man, I've got I got no complaints. <laughs> <laughs> so, dude, we connected. God, it seems like almost four years ago now. We've been knowing each other for some time around understanding life, evolution. We talked about putting some courses together and, and doing what we know is right for the people. And I got to say thank you for wanting to do this today because I know you're a busy man. I know you've got uh, your hands full. You're all up to your all seven foot of you with basketball, family, and all those great things. But I know you got some gifts inside of you, man. And I know that you've had a, a stellar journey as a journeyman from, from you know, California, California A, all the way up to the UCL of A as well, to, to the NBA, and now doing some phenomenal commentary over there for the Houston Rockets, which is pretty exciting, man. We're going to get into some of that stuff, man. But tell me, tell me how you're, how you're taking this latest part of your journey based on all the great things you've done so far, man. Where is the current lay of the land mentally for Ryan Hollins based on where he's at today, where he's been and where he wants to go moving on into the future? I, I think for me right now, um, identifying priorities. So for me, obviously my family and in the workplace and, um, yeah, there's a lot of loose ends. I like to share up, especially with moving. Um, you know, for those who don't know, when I played in the NBA, first half of my NBA lifetime was uh, on the East Coast. Then I had two years off of moving, you know, playing in L.A. with the Clippers. And then, you know, I, I moved a bit after that. So now this is the first time I've moved in a very long time of this, you know, this magnitude. And I'm moving with, you know, me and a wife are fine, but I think with the kids, that's an adjustment. So for me, it's prioritizing, hey, make sure I'm the best that I can be every day that I get to work. And then, you know, getting home and being, you know, present with the family. That's the biggest focus there. And then letting all the little things, you know, really add in or fall in from there. But I feel like if if I got too stretched out trying to do everything, I would go missing on the important things. And the whole reason I'm in Houston is to, you know, you mentioned work on the broadcast with the Rockets is to deliver on that front, you know. And then obviously, hey, man, you're – your reason that you do anything at a certain age and once you have kids is it's it's for them so i'd say identifying the priorities you know helps me work uh through those things because if you you miss those priorities you know in the list everything else kind of falls apart yeah yeah that's a good that's a good p word man from the from the priority standpoint oftentimes i think people don't even know what theirs are and so they're confused and then they, they they really don't have any stabilization. How has that conversation with your wife and the kids evolved over the years with the nature of the profession that you're in? And how do you as a father and as a husband communicate with them to make sure that they know Pops is there, Pops is in this for them? And helping them stay enthusiastic about their dad not necessarily being around because he's out playing ball or because he's out courtside doing some commentating and taking care of the family. How have you managed that conversation for them to keep them inspired and moving forward in their life without finding that as more of a disappointing type of a situation because you're not around all the time? You hit it right on the head. The keyword you said just how um... – my opportunities evolve, those conversations evolve too. You know, when the kids get older, they understand. They get you're not there, but it, it, it's a different, hey, I'm not here because I'm doing this, this, and this. Where when they're younger, you just kind of go, you give them a hug, bye-bye, and, and, and you get back. And then you got to establish, hey, man, I'm going to work. When you go to school, you're going to work. You know, when, when my responsibility gets heavy and I'm gone, you know, so that we can be taken care of. Your responsibility gets heavy too, because when I'm going, I need you to kind of fill some of my shoes. I need you to support, you know, your mother. 
and you you have importance here. You know, you can't just kind of act a fool when I'm when I'm gone. And you know, you're gonna have a, a a heavier load. So I think making sure those conversations are there and it's never gonna be perfect. You know, these kids get older sometimes they you know, with all due respect, when we're kids we're selfish. We kind of see the world around us, you know, and, and as you should, as a kid, you should be entitled to be selfish to a degree. But you know, you gotta be learn you gotta learn those lessons. Like, okay, I may not to get to do certain things or I may not to get to see my dad because he's out doing this. But guess what? Once the season's over, I get this guy every single day, you know? So I think it's it's kind of like making good on those, like you kind of got to get promises, you know, and then you got to deliver on those promises. Now, yeah, after the season, I'm going to take you to do this, this, and this, this is what we'll do. So that, you know, like anything, that keeps kids going, that keeps them going. And I think, um, you know, it, it's, it's a different lifestyle because I'm traveling in the NBA again, but I don't have the same responsibility. So mentally, I got to be present, but... I can't be more active at home. I can't do things where when you're playing, you're you're so 100% on, you know, your, your nutrition, uh, the physicality, the mental part. Everything takes away, like, your life force. We have so much life force that you got to give so much. So I still have to give that same, a decent level of life force, but I can be more present um, at home. I can do things, you know, because I'm not going to practice. I don't have to go to shoot around. I don't have to get treatment after. I don't have to watch – stay after and watch film. I don't have to do those things. So I still have prep. I still have to attack it with a level of professionalism, but it's not the same um, as when I played. It's a different workload. And, um, you know, I, I keep you get that, that energy to the family, but it still takes, still takes a balance. It's almost like a no off days, man. Yeah. <laughs> no yeah. off days, you know, pretty much. But like you said, the key is that those conversations evolve because when your career goes to another step, and you have loved ones, we're for, you're fortunate to have one, they got to understand what's going on. And I think sometimes we make those mistakes by not um, letting our evolutions be known. And then everyone else around you have to kind of guess or figure them out. Hey, we're moving to Houston because this, this, and this. This opportunity wasn't here in California. You know, people have to know, hey, this is going to help you and help us because of this, this, and this. Um, those are things that need to be made made known. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I love the thoroughness of how you explain that. You said a couple things that I cued in on that. I, I really, I'm not going to let the first one go, which is responsibility. Something that triggered this thought cycle that I'm going into right now with you was, you know, Hey, you don't have the same responsibility from when you were playing to now in the booth being courtside, commentating, things have shifted. However, with a guy like you that prides himself on competing and being the best and you know, almost like an underdog mentality, so to say, to earn his right and earn his keep, how do you prevent yourself from falling in between the cracks? Because you used to have a standard of all these other things that you had to meet at the highest level as the player but now as you mentioned it's shifted a little bit so in your decision making process how have you maintained that level of yourself without letting yourself dip too much because you have some extra freedoms or i guess you could say lackadaisical opportunities to some extent how would you say you've managed that part of the process i think the biggest growth i've had um from I want to say my second career in broadcasting to my first in basketball is understanding the business, understanding what your job entails. Because on paper, there's a description of what your job is. And then there's a whole lot of other things that help you keep your job, help you stay employed, help you even grow in a field, um, knowing um, who to talk to, um, to get a raise, knowing who to impress, knowing whose good idea um, that you want to be good idea. You want to be someone's good idea. You want to be someone's good idea because it's not just what they can do for you. It's what you can do for them. You want your boss to go to his boss or her boss and say, um, John, I want to promote him because he's going to do this, this, and this for us. So you want to be someone's good idea. You want to make good on those things for somebody. And when you, when I'm able to identify what the job entails is more. So for instance, when I played, Hey, in college, the team play was to win. 
to box out your mind. But the in, in the NBA, something I missed was sometimes forget the team play. You got to grab more rebounds because they're charting your rebounds per minute, which would have made me more money. So it's nice. We're going to keep you on because you're the team player. We kind of feel what you're doing. But at that time, it may not be quantified. And you want to make sure that the name of you're playing the game the right way because there's what we see as the game and then there's this is what works, okay? Um, for me, in the broadcasting side, I represent um, the organization, those players that are working their butts off, those coaches that are working their butts off, the front office. So it's my job, even though it's never written on a piece of paper, to, in my perspective, to be above and beyond and to make sure I know that the lines of communication are there and I represent them in the best fashion and shape and form. And then communicate that to the fans who this is the whole reason that we're doing it for so that they can, they can be on board and understand and have an enriched experience in which they're educated at the game. So I'll get to a game. Game starts at 7. I start about 2.30, 3 o'clock getting ready. I get to the game around 4.00. And, you know, between four and seven, I'm communicating with guys. I'm taking meetings, I'm engaging in conversations. I'm making sure I'm in tune with what's going on and how hard these guys are working just in the know. Um, and that's the important part um, of my job. I want to represent them well. And sometimes that's not always articulated on a piece of paper, but you are a um, – you are a – how do I put this? You're not on the team but you're a part of the team, mm -hmm. you know? And I think understanding the 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 value there and what it brings to the table, because I was a player. I knew how, what it was, and I've never worked in the front office or in coaching, but it's my job to understand what those guys are going through. So that's the, the okay, you have more free time, but you got to you gotta not just do your job, but you got to attack this three hours before the game. You go and attack that, and that's what sets you apart, you know? And, um, you know, making sure our guys and our, our organization is taken care of, you know. So it, it, it could go all the way from ownership to the equipment man or security guard in the arena. And that that's part of the experience that's brought. Mm. Yeah, I think about, as you say that, the impact of what the experience is that you're creating for these fans, right? I mean, let's just say, for example, you're – there's a broadcast on television. They're watching the game. And let's take you out of the equation and there's no sound. There's nobody giving them any interactive dialogue. And it's just watching guys play basketball. I mean, that would be pretty boring, right? So in essence, you're almost like the first part of the channel that feeds back to them the ability to have this immersive interaction when they can't be there live in person and there's got to be a tremendous amount of pride that you take in that, that they are hearing you first and that they're listening to you, watching you, and you get to be that vessel for them. That's pretty a neat uh, way to look at it. And and that's I can, I can totally understand how you've decided to approach that. I want to walk it back a little bit to the point where Ryan Hollins is no longer in the NBA and somehow – or some way, which is, I think, what you're going to share with us here in just a second after I ask my question. How how does broadcasting and sharing on the different networks become part of what you want to do next? Do you have a natural knack for that? Or does somebody tell you like, hey, dude, you'd be great on TV to share your thoughts on basketball? Were, were you already thinking about this in the middle of the NBA seasons because of something like what triggered you? to want to come and get into these positions that you're in today? What was that genesis? I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what the next chapter was going to be. I didn't know how soon the next chapter was going to start. I just didn't want to get caught slipping. Hmm. So the general fallback may have been, I just, I'll go into coaching. And for a player of my caliber, I probably would have been started off, you know, just rebounding for guys and chasing balls down or, Hey, having a, which would have been harder to do the NBA. If I did a, a four or five years overseas or 10, another 10 years overseas playing basketball. All right. So 
I felt like somewhere around the game would be the move. But well, the one thing the NBA does a great job of, they offer courses where they come in and help. And they they let you say, you want to try broadcasting, try broadcasting. You want to try coaching, try coaching. You want to try um, real estate. You want to try business and finance. So every time they would come by and ask me, hey, do you want to sign up for this course? You want to do this? Yep, sign me up. Yep, sign me up. Wow. Yep, sign me up. Wow. And finally I did broadcasting. And I was like, man. I'm I'm getting goosebumps. This hits different. I kind of like I kind of want to do this. I like this. When I watch the game, I feel like I have something to say. And um, it's about my fifth or sixth year, and from then on, I started putting the legwork. Um, because if you're privileged, I played ten years, man. You're privileged to make it past that point. You can start thinking about what the next episode looks like. But sometimes, guys, the average is what two, three years for NBA players. You don't ever get to that second deal after the rookie deal. Um, so I was extremely privileged to be a part of that. And then for me, um, moving forward, that was, um, you know, that was everything that, that was everything was understanding. I targeted what I wanted to do. I keyed in on it. And many, those who may not know, um, I only played one year overseas. I said, this ain't for my family. This ain't for me. And I attacked broadcasting. Like I, I had no other choice. You know, and it was really, it was a leap of faith. Faith is the assured expectation of that, which you cannot see. I had to go out on faith, man. and felt like I put in the work. I'm good enough. And like, <laughs> it made me mad in the sense that I didn't have deals. I didn't have offers set. I didn't have someone. I felt like I kind of put in the work while I was playing. And it wasn't like, a, oh, we want to bring you in and give you a job. We want to offer you. We want to this. So I decided to take it. And um, when I say take it, take an opportunity, create an opportunity. Many, I'm going to be honest, bro, when you got a family, I ain't seen no other option, bro. So it was like, this is the guy that's doing this job. This is me. Why don't I have that job? Am I not good enough? Am I not qualified enough? Or am I not having the right conversations with the right people? Hmm. And am I am I promoting myself? Am I making my if do I look like I deserve that job? Can I do that job if it was given to me as good as I might think I am? So I had to answer all those questions within myself and within those who hire and my colleagues. And so what did you discover in the in the asking yourself those questions? Did you find that you were lacking some things that you weren't good enough and to which you had to go work on it? Did you have to go connect with the right studio head? What, I mean, what was it that you revealed to yourself in asking those questions that ended up helping you receive what what it is you ended up getting? Like I'm I'm very curious about the like the you know those those moments, man, where you're like to hell, you know, I walked into the office at ESPN and I told this guy son of a you better give me this job and here's why like you know <laughs> those types of things man it's like did you do some crazy stuff like that all right so fun one that's an amazing loaded question one was um identify who had the job that i wanted and who i liked and who who i could emulate who i could be like um three names stephen a smith jalen rose and um mark jackson Mark is always smooth. He's a straight shooter. He's a likable guy. You enjoy hearing him on the broadcast. It's very comforting. And you feel like you know Mark. Um, he brings so much. He's just straightforward. Jalen Rose does everything. I watched Jalen Rose walk, walk out at a boxing event. And I said, this dude is so much more than just a basketball player. I see him have his own show where he talks about sports and everything. And then Stephen A is the guy that if something happens tomorrow, you go, man, what's Stephen A got to say? <laughs> like, That's right? That's so true. Like, That's more so than true. after the shot happens, right? Like, LeBron, all time lead scorer, you're like, man, what's Stephen A got to say? Right? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, you yeah. wonder, like, you yeah. wonder because he's created, he created all, he about to say some stuff, man. So um, I was like, how do they do that? What do they do? When it's a slow day, how does it work? How do they attack? How do they work behind the scenes? How did Jalen get the Jalen and Jacoby show? How did Mark Jackson, why is he smooth? Does he bash players? Is he honest with his players? Does he uplift guys? 
Is he too positive? When is he critical? When is he not? Stephen A, you know, when does he raise his voice? When does he come out calm? Um, when does he walk in a room? What's his presence like? I watched Stephen A. Smith walk in ESPN LA because he was recording his show. He was moving. He was traveling for his show. He walked in like, he walked in, he walked in the, the booth like prime Mike Tyson. Remember when Mike Tyson used to walk around and he had like that glow that I'm Iron Mike that don't touch me that like, 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 hey, is that Mike right there? Like, yeah. like you felt his, he walked in like that. And I'm like, I need that. Mm. Jalen Rose is likable. He's in everything. He's cool, calm, collected. He's himself. He can, he can have fun and spin something. He brings energy. How can I be that? So I bug Stephen. I bug Jalen. I bug those who worked with those people. I ask opinions about them. I ask what people like. I ask what people don't like. I ask how the show was supposed to be created. I ask how the show can get back on point. I ask what the vibe of the shows are. What is what do you, what is the producer looking for when he's doing the show? How can I deliver? So people forget the producers are the coach. So when you come out onto these shows and you don't impress the coach, that's the difference between saying like, dang, I'm going to book you 10 different times versus, ah, nice. Hey, do we have to use Ryan? Like, so I identified who the positions are. I identified the coordinating producer that I produ that I impress him or her, that I get in their face. Hey man, who books for this show? Who's the head who talks to that person that does this? everything is different. So I didn't identify those people um, and I attacked them. And then I, I studied what each and every person's job was studied hard. And then I also looked at the company as a whole. I, 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 I assessed the company and said, well, what are the needs that they have? Or like, why don't they use more basketball guys? Well, hell I, I can talk basketball, football, soccer, tennis, golf. I'm going to find a way to make a take. A lot of times we just say we don't want to talk about nothing but just basketball. But they appreciate you being able to do four hours of radio. They appreciate the versatility. Is that the mic drop? Oh, I, I yeah, thought, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, I thought no, you were. No, I thought no, you no, could. I, yeah, I, I know yeah. you got. I know you got radio voice. You could talk for days no, too. I, I man. Can I go. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, 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 I could go. But um, yeah, you know, I mean, dang, I, I don't know if I answered my second part of what I wanted to say. But yeah, I, I identify the people. I went in. And I saw Steven gives you the, the take, love him or hate him, the emotion. Jalen gives you versatility. And Mark Jackson is um he's a he's likable, you know. Yeah. And I and by the way, because I understand sports and I'm a fan of sports and I, I've watched them all, I can totally understand what you're saying in context there. I guess my follow-up question to that to go a little bit deeper is once you saw that that's how Steven was, that's how Jalen was, and that's how Mark was, did you then say, how do I create my own identity in this process? Or did you say, I will already know how I will approach this so I'm not like them? Or were you trying to find your voice to some extent to be able to get on air? And so how did you end up positioning yourself in that capacity after you discovered some of those answers or, or identify some of their personalities on air? Um, I start understanding the content business. And I remember one time I had my, um, my, on my, on my Twitter, my Instagram deal, I put like in my bio, like I create content. And I think that went so far over people's heads that they didn't understand it. So when I said in the sense of I create content, so um, you're going to say something on your show, right? And they take those clips and those clips go and go viral or they get played again on other shows and they travel. When you say something profound, you say a certain name, you say a clip, right? So when you speak with a certain clip or have a certain fun take or you find a way to engage, it drives. Hmm. I found out how to be engaging and then I found out kind of like the language of it. All right, so go look and Wingo wanted something on their show. First take wanted something on their show. If I was calling a, a college game, they wanted something on their show. If I was on, uh, 
you know, behind the lines. It, it's something on. It's a different format. So I was delivering like what you want. I'm like Burger King, like how you want it, right? Like the, the producers would joke with me, like really, I, I was like, can you do that? I'm like Burger King, baby. What do you want? I want it. I would instill confidence, you know, before we talked in the um, the show, people and like, oh, done. I got you. We're gonna kill this segment. Done. It's a wrap. Don't worry about it. Hey, we're going to show. Hey, why don't I have my questions before the show? I need to be prepared. Like I'm on your head. So you come in feeling confident with me as a as a host, as a guest, um, whatever it may be, because like you're looking for something. I was delivering, like mm. I found out what was being looked for. In NBA early in broadcasting, I was just doing what I wanted or what I thought was cool. What you think is cool don't matter. And then how you deliver matters. And obviously, I'm not gonna sell my soul in the process. You know, but how you deliver, and it's not what you say, it's how you say it. And then I, I talk to everyone that would talk to me. Hey, what is this? What am I supposed to do? What do you, like, I asked a million questions. And all those answers were different for di even different, different shows. Then I start realizing what travels and what, who was a good producer. You feel me? Now, now I just find out what the producer, when I found out who were the good producers. Who was producer A? And then I hear them talk, they talk like that show don't do this, this, and this, it's dry and it's boring. And then I found out how to be Ryan Hollins mm. on the show mm. in the format. Cause it's, if it's just me and my partners talking, we slapping each other in the back of the head, we laughing, we're joking, we're like just on some, but like, how do you bring that out, you know, um, on the show? So it's then sounds... I want to be a team. Oh, go ahead. Finish. Go ahead. And then you want to, and then you, and then you want to, and then you got your teammates too. You want to be a team player. So I wanted people to enjoy working with me too. But if I come on your show, Manny, and I just, ah, I'm, I'm doing the bro podcast. It's mine. You're like, I don't want to deal with this dude. But if I come on and I'm like, man, Manny, you did good. Da, 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 da. Well, how you feel about this? Hey, I spice something up. I let you run. Some people are comfortable with the controversy with you in their face. Some people are like, nah, bro, I want to be respected i want to be this tempo that tempo i want some intellectual stuff like so i had to find out what my teammates like i had to be a uh you know a pass first point guard you know what i'm mm -hmm. saying am i a pass first front point point guard or you want me a combo guard a shooting guard you want me firing them up you know hey man in a good team what happens if you pass the ball it's gonna come right back to you you know so i learned a lot of those um factors man the amount of content that you just shared that I could dive into is is worthy of days worth of recording a couple things I think I always try to go you know I'm in in real time I'm looking I'm looking for how can I ask the question that would be the most impactful for somebody to overcome something or to get better at something that that they might be struggling with or sometimes it's even something that I've 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 struggled with or struggle currently with you said something fascinating in there about you had to go do all these things, create the content, figure out what they wanted, and then find yourself without losing yourself. I might be paraphrasing that a little bit. How did you avoid not losing yourself in the process? And maybe you can add something to that where you've realized that other people, I think you said sell your soul, other people go that route and maybe they can maybe people can prevent themselves from you know not losing themselves or selling their souls and it doesn't have to literally be you know hey guy offered me a million dollars to go do something nasty in the back room type of sell your soul but not just 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 yourself right just your identity that you get on tv but you can't be yourself and that's the selling your soul equivalent what do you would have to say to some of that stuff my man i'm for me to answer that, um, I'm a man of God first and I'm a man of my family. So within that, if I'm not cool because of that or I'm not cussing with you during a break or I'm not, you know, uh, disrespecting my wife or my family or trying to dive into something that I don't know about or that I, I don't do 
outside of this, I'm I would not cross those lines. I'm not gonna be that. You know, you're getting you're getting who I am, you know, and I'm not I'm not gonna dive. Um I'm one of Jehovah's Witnesses. I don't celebrate birthdays, I don't do Christmas, I don't do um, you know, the holidays, you know, so um maybe lucrative for me to do maybe a Christmas drop or go to the Christmas party with the team or with the boss. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. You know, I don't drink. So after work, I'm not going to have a drink with you because I don't drink. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I'm not going to pretend to drink. We'll go out every day to have a drink. No, I'm not going to have a drink. It's not what I do. You know, either, either, um, what has the saying go stand for stand for something or or stand for nothing at all, however, like, you know what I'm saying, man? Like, like you gotta, you have to be you, you know? And I don't know what that is. Every, each and every person is different. So um, whatever you're comfortable with, with, that that's you, that's your personal thing. But I wasn't gonna, when I say sell my soul, I wasn't gonna lose myself at that. So if you didn't like me for something, um, you just not gonna like me. And that doesn't mean I need to, you need to disrespect anybody because of that, or you need to be in someone's face or because of that, you should be respectful of everyone and no matter what scenario. And even like scenarios where um, I could have kind of backstabbed somebody or like, I don't need to upstage you to try to look good on a show. A lot of times people don't feel that someone's over talking or trying to upstage someone. So I, like I give this example, and this was hard. When I played for the Clippers, I played with DeAndre Jordan. DeAndre Jordan was the center ahead of me. I was behind him. We played in L.A. We had everything to gain. DeAndre was still learning the game. I got a chance to learn a lot of the NBA game from Kevin Garnett. Before every single game, I made it my due to encourage DeAndre Jordan, talk to him about game plans. I wanted to make sure that he was the best that he could be going into the game. Was that the smartest thing for me to selfishly be the best or to take his job, so to speak? Or let him in situations where he maybe needed a, a brother to pick him up to not do that. No. If that job wasn't meant for me, I'm not going to sell my soul or change who I am to try to better myself. It would never feel right. So if it came down to me and you on a show, I want you to do just as good as me. I go behind the scenes with an analyst and say, hey, man, if you take this angle right here, that would be dope. Say this, you know this, remember that? Oh, you're right. Like, oh, that's cool. Hey, I might not say this. Do you want to use this line? It may not it made our show better. It may be willing to help me out in certain situations. You know what I'm saying? Or like even if I didn't like you, I didn't want to go back backstab you or say something. You had to really grind my gears before I say, man, you know what? He's not a good person. I don't want to work with him. Mm. You know? And then I think, you know, not to be like this positioning, like. Are you in the position before you can turn something down? It was a long time, brother, before I ever, someone texted me and I said, no, I'm not going mm. on that show. Essentially, I did everything I could, everything, you know. Hey, I didn't like the way that person talked to me. I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to go on that show, you know. But before then, I would do any and everything, you know. And I think sometimes, Manny, like if you're trying to get into broadcasting, you're trying to get into a certain field, and you have something that you can do that can so showcase those talents in any level, you go and do it. Like, Manny, I would go and talk to kids. I would talk to five and six-year-olds because it was a crowd. Mm. And guess Powerful. what? People on TV are no different than five and six-year-olds. You want to know why? Five or six-year-old has a three-second attention span. So how do you talk to kids, right? Hey, guys, how are you? Are you ready for this? Yay, energy, right? Yep. So it sounds silly, but what are the personalities that grab you? Energy. Stephen A, energy. I'm a three-year-old. I'm going to tune into what he got to say. It's like a rap lyric that, that goes, and it gets stuck in your head. So I want to bring that energy. If I was doing a radio interview, because when you start popping, they're going to hit you with a thousand interviews that you don't feel like doing. So I'm like ducking off at, at dinner in the side of these rooms doing these interviews. 
But guess what? If one person hears that interview, likes what I say, and they want to search me up or you never know who's listening, man, I'm I'm coming with it. I'm coming with it, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, for me, those are the big elements that I attack. And I feel like you can't be too big to do these little events. Like if you ain't making the money you think you should be making, like like I said, it was a long time if I said no to some stuff, you know? But I ain't never too big to do something and that's a chance where I could grow. Or I'm coming in there, like I learned from Stephen A, I'm walking in that thing like Prime Mike Tyson with a presence. Hmm. This dude coming in, I'm coming in like that dude and I'm going to over deliver. And then sometimes I mess with like a new show. I got to the point I'd like mess around with him. I come in, I'll be like with a real monotone, real chill, like act like disinterested. And then I wait till the lights turn on and I get in your face. <laughs> oh, snap. Oh, yeah, yeah. we didn't know he had that. Yeah. We didn't know that was going. I just act this in. Oh wow! Like I came in, like I I came in for I came in for the for the kill, man. How how does I love, I love how this is going so far, man. Just to be honest with you, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I really do get a joy out of this in general. But I always, in my mind checking the, the the what I think is the impact of what's being said and where that's leading me to is you know I think you mentioned the situation with DeAndre and you you were sort of uh you know helping him rise up and you didn't have to do that now you are taking sort of the same approach I guess in your you know just in your own mentality to keep being better at what you do what was, how do you transition from a mindset of physicality? While I understand there's also mentality in it, where your body sort of is the leading component and you're a big man, seven feet, got some, got some gift from God there to then having to be more of an intellect, less frame, right? Less body forward and more mentally forward in your communication, in your entertainment, um, and your ability to interact and engage and do those different things. How do you, Ryan, transform from that guy that was, you know, I'm seven feet tall, I'll just dunk on you to now I have to do something radically different and still dunk on you per se and be the best at that. So could you share some a little... A little bit more about how that sort of transition mentally went for you. I had to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. So in the NBA, when you go to a training camp, you know, week long training camp, you're doing two a days, you know, you're there early staying after because you're a young guy. By that third day, your legs are noodles and you're just picking yourself up to go. Your body's hurting, it's worn down. And a while, after a while, your body gets used to it. Um, when you go to train, you go to lift weights, you go to do these, you beat your body to a pulp and your body just gets used to the grind. That's what it is. Um, mentally, um, going in to do four hours of radio, like you're kind of done after the first two hours, bro. So, I had to learn how to do two hours of radio, stay interesting, come with the right mindset to attack it, come with the mindset to love it because we're not going to love every single thing that we do. And like ESPN, when I was there on the campus doing a real grind, my sports center hit started at 6 a.m. So I had to get up at five on air at six, like we're live, ready to go at six. So to my body clock, I'm waking up at 2 a.m., right, 5 a.m., 2 a.m., because I'm on the West Coast, so I'm in Bristol. So my body clock saying it's 2 a.m., live and ready to go. Then I would try to fill up my day with multiple days and multiple shows that I could do in hits. So I'm aggressively finding other opportunities. If I got a spot in between, I would run home and run to the hotel and take a nap and then get right back up and go. And then I would set up meetings. So in the afternoons, I would try to meet with this show producer, this show boss, this coordinating producer, this head of the company. 
and I will bug people. And sometimes those people wouldn't want to respond or take meetings. So I just kept sending emails and kept sending them and kept communicating, kept talking. Um, and that's um, really, that's really what finally got me, um, you know, helped me get there. But I think like mentally, like you want to fall asleep. And then it, within that path, I think to answer the question, how did I get there? You got to remember what's driving you. So for the NBA, it was physically, it was a lifelong dream. It was something I loved. And like, I didn't lose sight of that vision. So if my legs hurt, as my body hurt, as I didn't get the feel of it going, there was no way I was going to leave that opportunity on the table. For me in a broadcasting, I was competing again. Now I saw the shows that I want to be on. And I was angry that people weren't looking at me or asking me to be on these shows. And I want to make them look at me. I want to make them see me. I felt like certain people were on the shows and they weren't bringing nothing to the show. And I said, why is that not me? Why is that not me? And I kept working and grinding. So um, from that aspect, um, I I learned the game. I found the motivation. And I had to beat those muscles up because there are mental muscles that after a while, we tap out after 30 seconds. You, you know what I'm saying? And then, like, when in the sports business, like, it never stops because we're just watching on our phones what's happening. We're watching games. We're collecting um, information, so to speak. And then at that process, it was even longer because I was learning. So I had to, like, watch all those shows, but in a, in a format, not where I'm enjoying the show, where I'm studying the show. I mean, I enjoyed it or I made myself enjoy it, but I'm like, I'm studying. What can I pick up? you know, from these guys. A, a, a true hungry learner at your core, right? I mean, that, that's a, the mentality of how do I, regardless if I'm training for camp or if I'm training to get in the studio or if I'm in the locker room pumping weights, like just doing what it takes to get there. Um, I think of you when you say a lot of what you say as one that was given the platform of being in the NBA as a catalyst to refine your personal abilities less than your physical capabilities. And it would give you this opportunity to go forward today in a different arena per se. And you remind me of leadership, like a great leader, which is much different than a great athlete that just plays. And I'll give you the perfect example. Antonio Brown is a great athlete. He's a moron, right? Just like a complete imbecile in how he approaches, how he lives for whatever reasons that that is. You have taken sort of this ability, this, this intelligence and transitioned to let yourself be in the spotlight in a valued way not that you weren't before. I'm curious how you think about what makes great leaders versus subpar performers, or even in your world of, because you've mentioned sort of the producers of the coaches, you, you know, you had your head coach back in your playing days. What makes a great coach versus an average coach? What are some of those identities or perspectives that you have that you've seen based on your experience that really can separate the guys like a Phil Jackson as an example versus the guy that just kind of gets through and so be it. Also, same context, a great player like you that goes out to be a great coach. Uh, I think of um, the Steve Kerr, it's a great player, went on to be a great coach, right? At, for the Warriors versus somebody else that doesn't do that. I'm sure you probably have a lot to say about that, man. Hopefully that wasn't too loaded, but I'm really excited to hear the answer for this one. Um, a great leader, coach, however you want to put it, gets the most out of each and every person. So, and then he makes like those pieces fit together. So um, let, let's say like in a basketball world, you may have a guy and we all have different, like, like our games are like our personalities. You may have a guy who loves to shoot the basketball. He's good at shooting the basketball. He's okay at defense, but he's actually great at passing too, right? So to give him opportunities that enhance who he is, 
Um, you may have some guys that are really good on defense that can guard anybody. They don't have weaknesses on defense. But on offense, all they can do is, hey, shoot a three or dunk the basketball, whatever it is. So a great coach is going to pair that player with another player that complements them so that they can work together. Mentally, you know, a coach has to motivate. Sometimes a coach has to be really hard on his player to motivate the player. Sometimes a coach has to chill. Sometimes the coach has to be encouraging. Sometimes it's a mental game. So the greatest coaches bring the best out of their players and they put them in positions to be successful. And then sometimes you, they make guys buy in to things that may not be natural for them because the other side of the road is that much more beautiful, you know? So you got to know when to just get the best out of a player for when they are just being who they are. And then you get the best out of a player for something they're not comfortable with because, but who they can become. So for me, those are the greatest coaches. Uh, some coaches are good enough just to roll the balls out. You got a group of good players. You put them on the floor and they, and they win. They're already that good. You're kind of just there. You're just sitting there. Um, and then like we talked about those other great coaches that bring the best out, put them in positions and help them grow. And then you have some coaches that excel where, hey, you give them a group of good players, they're going to go get you some wins. And then you got some coaches who are really good at developing. You give them a group of bad players, they're going to get the max potential out of, their, out of their players. So there's also different type of leaders. Both are effective. Um, some coaches can do both. Some coaches don't want to do both. It's a different type of uh, coach that can develop a player. When I say player, when I say coach, we articulate this over to boss. We articulate this over to ourselves. We articulate that over to um, ourselves as a, a a worker, as an employee, as an entrepreneur. Um, so that's something that is you know, I, I see as a factor. Hey, Haywood or Workman, one of most uh, as a ball player, entrepreneur, rich man. He's wealthy at this point. But the one thing he did instead of just taking on started with Wendy's. And I'm sure he's got other ventures that he just expressed, hey, he made sure everybody treated people with care and respect. And he used essentially Bible principles with his employees, a respect, of cleanliness of those things. And then he went down and got and grinded and cleaned the floors and did burgers himself. So he wasn't above anything that his workers were doing. But what he did is he created a proper culture. He was positive, And that made... You can go to any Wendy's, you can go to any fast food place, but that place is clean. The people work hard, they're smiling, they're giving you something, they're giving you an experience in which you want to come back for because the food isn't that big of a deal. So um, to answer your question as far as a leader, do you get the most out of your um, employees, your, your, your players? And then I would say also um, awareness. If we want to become a leader, we have to be aware. So a coach's job is to be aware of maybe it's 100 people at a workplace. Maybe it's 15 basketball players. Maybe it's 53-man roster on a football team, you know? So you have to be aware of these guys and everything going on. And if you can't be aware of 100 people because that's, like, pretty tough, you got to delegate responsibility of, you know, other coaches, assistant coaches who can do that. Or, or managers and other positions that can do that. You have to be know the climate of what you're doing, you know, and maybe some of us are so wealthy that we can, uh, just as long as the numbers come back, they're not falling, we, we do that. But for the most of us, you gotta be hands-on what we're doing if we choose to step into a leadership role, which is awareness. Cause when you're the boss, you can't come in having a crappy day. You, you, you ruin the flow of everybody else. You don't have bad days as a boss. And when you think, from I think what you're saying, for those who have to understand, I became a better broadcaster. I became a better basketball player when I understood what my coach wanted. You become a better student when you could be the teacher. So sometimes as you sit there as teachers, students, if you were a teacher for the day, how would you do the lesson? We always hear the joke about the, the bad kid in the class that tells the bad that the student gets told from the teacher, go, you come up to the board, you teach class for a day. And he goes, I can't do it. Well, hey, let's like really teach that student how to do it because they're going to sit in class way different. I started mm -hmm. approaching basketball different. And when I learned that side on broadcasting, I approached broadcasting with a completely different lens. 
that's a powerful point of view, man. Like a super powerful point of view. I I can't express the the value and the sort of the dimensionalization of of that. Um I, I want to sit down with you for for hours, man. I know we've hit almost an hour mark already. I have something that was kind of like seriously on my heart about a question, and then I'll ask you about what you see behind me, and then we'll wrap up. But the last question that I have, I think something that a lot of what we need today, like what we like as a society, we genuinely and I think even more so desperately need more of this, which I think is part of what you do every single day. And that's have healthy debate. You guys can get on camera, get on air, and have a conversation to the extreme that it seems confrontational, but it's a debate. And whether that's somebody that's coming up and trying to graduate in college and go out and you know become a professional in that department, or if it's somebody in their business or it's their household, how can you, Ryan, based on your gift and where you're at today, encourage more debate and why it it's valued and not this is important too not care about what people think of you in that approach so that people would be willing to go out and share their ideas and their thoughts and challenge what other people have to say and not be demoralized internally you got to have rules and people forget the rules so, Manny, if we're debating a topic, right, for sure, and I think you're speaking of kind of like a first take aspect, and I think this goes over a lot of people's heads, I'm not going to challenge your credibility. So I'm not going to look at you and say, you don't know what you're talking about, right? Or if we're having a basketball debate, right? Let's say we are, right? I'm never, I don't want to ever throw out, I played the game, right? Because that's essentially taking your credibility out. Whatever you say doesn't matter, I win. It's a cheat. You know what I'm saying? It's like you guys are telling jokes against each other. And it's your mama. Like, once you say your mama, we got to fight, right? <laughs> like, it's no one, nothing else matters, right? You got to fight, all right? No more jokes, all right? Um, am I laughing with you or am I laughing at you? You know? So there's certain lines that you don't cross. And then, like, are you bigging up somebody? Hey, Manny, you, <laughs> you're an expert. You've been in the field for the last 15 years. But I got to tell you, you're wrong here, brother, because of X, Y, and Z. So I respect you, you know? Um, and then do I know your sensitivities? So if I don't know you in a certain way, I'm not going to push you in a certain way. And I think what a lot of people forget is the intelligence behind it. Um, if you have an opinion that's shared and you have facts behind it and you want to go back and forth on corresponding facts, that is encouraged. That's an amazing. You know, people see a show and they go, oh, you're just stupid. You don't know what the heck you're talking about. Well, why don't I know what I'm talking about? Explain to me what makes what you're saying so right or me so wrong. So you got to actually do your homework. <laughs> you know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, for instance, when I'm going first take, bro, I was like going back to school, bro. I literally had pages of information, of stats, of binders written out. So we get to the show for first take at like 5 a.m., meeting starts, going over the topics, right? And then I'm writing an essay per topic. So while you only got 10 or 15 minutes, I got an essay's worth of information to prove why I'm correct. And then I got to deliver what's on paper. Hmm. You feel me? Absolutely. So debate doesn't mean we're arguing. Debate doesn't mean we're belittling. We're exchanging facts. I'm trying to convince you. I'm going into court and I'm convincing you of why I'm correct or why you're wrong and what your why your facts are uh, correct. You know, I'm persuading you to a side. I'm not just belittling you. I'm not pulling the, I played in the NBA, man, you ain't play. So don't tell me about Michael Jordan. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm right. not pulling that. I'm respecting you. Because anybody can pull the, the bully card. I'm bigger than you go fight someone smaller or go try to or 
you know, no one agrees and you get a, ah, there's this noise, a yelling match. It's not, this is me, and this is you. It's me, this is you, you know? So that's that's pretty much it. And then sometimes with your friends, you can throw some antics in there, have some fun, but I got to know you. We got to mm-hmm. up each other within mm-hmm. that. And in, in that process, it almost becomes a, a challenge to acquire what are your research-based facts as your data set and then you simply state your case based on what you found in your discovery of these facts, right? It's like, you're like, oh, okay, here's what I found. What about this? Well, you don't support that, but I got A, B, C, and D here that says this. So it's like, you know, you're, you're basically saying, well, I did this work to this research. Therefore, I believe that to be what I know the best as. What do you got type of thing, right? It's, it's, and it becomes a, a healthy exchange. Very well said, man. I, I'm, I'm so happy that you uh, shared that from your perspective because I think that is an honest arena that you're in right now where somebody can be looking at from the outside in and say, these guys are just at each other's throats. Like they don't know. It's the other one that I think of is um, Shannon and, uh, oh God, on football. Godly. Skip. Skip. And skip. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, right? Because it's just like they're barking at each other all the time. And so someone like you probably just, what you just said, shed some light on that, man. So um, again, man, much appreciated. So- Wrapping this thing up, man, I'm going to let you get back to you thing in Miami, man. You probably got to get home on a flight pretty soon back to Houston to spend some time with the family. She got a game somewhere else. But obviously, you know, our 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 show here is always, always in the grow, and it really defines the pursuit of self-actualization, as I mentioned, you know, however someone chooses to interpret that. For me, it's about making progress daily, meaningful pursuit of the next level and finding ourselves in all areas. So when I show this to you, man, what does it mean to you? What does always on the grow mean to Ryan Hollins of all folks? Not getting content. Um, and sometimes the growth isn't money. Sometimes it's spiritual. Sometimes it's physical. Sometimes it is, it, it is financial. Um, but I think that not being content and coming back humbly and seeing that maybe the way you were doing something was wrong. Maybe seeing somebody else's perspective and respecting another perspective or view or way of life. Understanding, uh, grow is forgiving. That's probably the hardest thing we do, right? Is forgive. Um, and honesty, we've talked about that a lot, being honest with yourself. You ain't never honest with yourself, you gotta grow. So you gotta find a mix. And that's where a balance is so important. I gotta find a balance of walking in the arena like I'm the baddest boy in that building and then being humble enough to go sweep the floors mm-hmm. or do any show that I'm supposed to do or, or showing up early for something or whatever, you know, taking less money, but seeing more opportunity, you know, it may be. So um, to me, that's what growing is. I'm going to be better today than I was yesterday. And I'm going to be accountable and I'm going to have balance. and I'm going to know how to, step into situations and I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to be better, but I, sometimes we have to check the awareness, the self-awareness before we can grow. So sometimes that skip get that step gets missed, right? Let's be better at this. Let's be better at this. Like, whoa, self-check, self-check, grow, self-check, grow. So I think that's t- to me what um, definitely what growth means. And then at the end of the day, we, we really find out it's not even about us. It's about passing it on to somebody else, paying it back. So true, man. And as we get older, we start to realize how important it is to do things we enjoy. At least I, that's what I'm discovering. You say, or I should, I, should I say it reads right there on your shirt? This is why we play. It's why we do this, man. This is why we do this. And I got to, no, first of all, uh, where can people find you, man, on social and elsewhere when you're not courtside or even when you are courtside? You wouldn't mind sharing a few of those things. Check me out uh, first and foremost on the Houston Rockets uh, broadcast, man. Having a blast. We have a great young developing squad that's amongst the youngest in the entire NBA. Uh, check out my social, write me, uh, say what's up, do whatever. I always appreciate the love. You know that, Manny, on uh, Ryan Hollins on Instagram, the Ryan Hollins on Twitter. You can find that. And I got actually a new podcast, new venture myself that's called uh, NBA Rookie Life. It's via Sirius XM in the NBA, which is like a cool opportunity that i am thrilled to be a part of like super cool so go check that out give it a listen 
uh, if you join, enjoyed what you hear, heard here, you know, uh, that, 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 that's about it, man. No, man, Ryan, I, you know, slowly I'm saying this, but this, you know, podcast here is a recent, you know, uh, renewal for me and getting back into it. Um, and I started reaching out to folks and without skipping a beat, man, you responded almost instantly and we're willing to jump in almost like, you know, we've, we've, we've been boys for years, man. I know life gets us and we go in different directions and, uh, things, things take their direction based on where you're going, but I can't express how much thanks I have to you for jumping on and, you know, always communicating and wanting to do stuff for people, man, and being there to help and, you know, still managing all the other great things you've got, brother. And hopefully I can continue to bring value to you uh, and what you're doing, man. I'm always here for you. And if, uh, if I, if I can do that, man, let me brother, let's rock this thing. Yeah, no, nah, no, nah, I appreciate it, man. You know, Manny, like I, I feel like you've always been straightforward with me. It was never about the venue or wh where you were. It's about people, you know, and I, and I feel that from you. So I rock with you, man, wherever you are, I'm there. You got me, man. So I, I appreciate you, big dog. You, you, you know that man, but like, like, like you said, like, it's like, was it a number? Was it this or is it Ryan Hollins? And I feel like for you, you see people, man. So, so keep that up. That's why we rock with you, man. Yeah, man. Well, let's keep people in it out, baby. Let's let's keep let's keep slamming the dunks, my brother. <laughs> All right, man. I'm gonna hit this pause record button and then we can jam. Space jam. I'm trying to throw in all my basketball funnies, man. I don't know if it's working <laughs> right now. <laughs> all right, brother. Appreciate you, man.